Hi everybody, welcome to week eight, and this is the second and last week where we will be discussing the the Agronoff book, Collaborating to Manage. So let me move right into that. So first of all, what I want you to know about this particular lecture is I'm not going to go into the readings too much. I am going to a little bit. I'd really like you to get into the readings and this lecture to help you formulate thoughts for our discussion. Um, so the point is, I, I want to provide some what I call debatable assertions. I have several assertions I'm going to throw out there and provide some evidence for why I make these assertions. And because they are assertions, you're certainly welcome to disagree with my assertions or present other evidence that uh, or think about other evidence that might refute my evidence. Uh, or come up with assertions of your own, sort of as a mental exercise. But these assertions have to do with collaboration and have to do with why or why not collaboration might be a good idea. And so then finally, what I'm going to ask you to do at the end of this lecture is based on the readings and what the thoughts that I'm giving you here, um, I'm asking you to discuss in this week's discussion board some negatives and positives about collaboration from a particular perspective. Okay, so here are my assertions, and I'm going to take these one at a time and present some evidence. And it, I could have thought of more assertions, and I think you could as well when it comes to collaboration, and I would encourage you to do so. But here's mine. One, I say that I assert that we are stuck with a myth of dual federalism that only applies to certain policy areas. Two, I say that we have a view of economic sectors in our economy, that's a little redundant, uh, economic sectors that is transaction based and therefore perpetuates a myth of separate sectors with separate interests. In other words, there are these, these solid walls of separation between the for-profit sector and the government sector and the nonprofit sector, that each of those sectors you can wall off um, very visibly and then talk about the interests of each of those sectors uh, as if they don't intersect. Uh, third, I assert that citizens, that is citizens of the United States, have no basic understanding. And I, I mean, no, I was I almost put little, but I, I just said no basic understanding about the sheer volume of collaboration and alternative service delivery that is happening in the country. Fourth, I say that government in the United States, and I mean all governments, really from the national to the state to local to specialized governments, government in the United States operates largely through collaboration, yet almost no one who runs for public office talks about it. And maybe this is due to hyperpartisanship. Uh, next, I assert that many nonprofits cannot exist independently of their missions of providing services on behalf of governments. In other words, what I'm saying there, I'm asserting that uh, nonprofits didn't form, and I don't mean this about all nonprofits, I just mean it about some nonprofits, that these nonprofits didn't form to meet a particular mission. And then, incidentally, later on, they started collecting or getting grants or donations from governments to do particular work. That my assertion is that some nonprofits form specifically to do quasi-government work. And so without that work, they wouldn't exist independently. And again, I don't mean all nonprofits. And then finally, our public discourse, that is what you hear people talking about, what you see on the news networks, what you see on Instagram or Twitter or Facebook, our public or just people you run into, face to face of all things, our public discourse seems to be an argument about agency theory versus stewardship theory. And Agronoff talks about that, and I'm going to talk about that as the final thing. So I'm taking these assertions one at a time right here um, through the course of the rest of this lecture. So first, I say we are stuck with a myth of dual federalism that only applies to certain policy areas. So recall, we did talk about the theory of dual federalism, and I'm going back to that. But I, what I would provide as evidence to refute that dual federalism is is super active, it is active, it's not completely dead, um, 
it, it may be largely outmoded in a lot of areas. What you have to do really is just follow the money. This and uh, this happens to be from Hugh, and I give you the link there. So uh, actually, on most of this evidence, I provide you with some sources. And if you want to link on these links, use the um, no narration no narration version uh, of the of the PowerPoint slides, which I will provide in the weekly module. But this comes from Pew, and this is just uh, on average federal grants as a share of state budgets from 1966 to 2015. So you see there over on the left that in 1966, on average, about 25% of state budgets was from federal sources. And then that continues to climb through the years. Those blue bars are recession periods, which provide you some interesting food for thought, really. Um, but it climbs uh, in 2010 up to 35 percent, more than 35 percent of state budgets on average. So 2010, the reason that's significant is because the Obama administration um, passed the American Recovery Act as soon as it came into office in the in the wake really of the Great Recession, as it's called by economists, that that started you know, during the fall of 2008. And so that spike is there uh, mostly because of that. And then it goes back down. But the point is that over 30% now of all state budgets on average are from federal sources. So if dual federalism exists, that is sovereignty uh, on the part of the state and sovereignty on the part of the national government within separate spheres, if that exists, it's been greatly diluted. This pie chart actually talks about that 31, 32% of those state budgets and what is the composition of that. So you can see that, that that portion of those state budgets is more than half composed of healthcare spending, so Medicaid. So if a state theoretically uh, gets $4 billion, that would be a small state like Nebraska, say $4 billion from the national government, more than $2 billion of that is Medicaid. And so you can see the other areas that we talk about in our public discourse and claim um, indicate uh, a lot of federal involvement, but those are kind of smallish portions, right? Uh, transportation, <laughs> that actually talks about infrastructure, something we, we constantly talk about, um, the shape of our highways, of our airports and other things. The transportation spending from the national government is actually quite small, has been quite small. This was 2014, but the percentages don't vary that much. K-12 education in 2014 was about 10%, which isn't nothing, but it's not certainly not indicative of any kind of takeover of uh, K-12 education by the national government. Higher education, almost 4%, important, but not an overwhelming percentage uh, of of the federal dollars that come to states. Here's my second assertion. That is that we have a view of economic sectors that is transaction based and therefore perpetuates a myth of separate sectors with separate interests. I'm going to use an interesting example with you all on this one. Healthcare. I use healthcare because healthcare is such an emotional topic uh, and such a divisive topic, and we talk about it all the time. Um, be, and and I would assert that a lot of the argumentation and uh, yelling at each other is based on some faulty assumptions. Um, so this is from uh, Peterson Kaiser, which is part of the uh, Kaiser. Uh, nonprofit, which really is very involved in healthcare um, research. So look at the two sides of those two horizontal bar charts. That's so those represent 1970 and 2016. So 2016 is important because that is after the passage of the Affordable Care Act, when the Affordable Care Act was operating about as efficiently or maximally as it was ever going to. Um, and that was after the court case that actually said that Medicaid expansion could not be mandatory for the states. 
Um, so what this these bar charts track is what is called national health expenditure. So if, all that means is if you took everything, every dollar that went into health care spending and combined it all in one sum, and then you went back and disaggregated where that money came from, they find four sources, out of pocket, private insurance, public insurance, and other. So other, of course, is a big blob of everything else. But out of pocket is what individuals spend on health care. So you can see that it is true in 1970, people were spending a lot more uh, from out of pocket expenses. So, I mean, in the, in the system overall, 34% of all the spending of healthcare was from out of pocket. What this chart actually doesn't show, and if you read the report, if you go to the link and read this, is that paragraph right up there on top. In dollar terms, out-of-pocket expenditures have grown steadily since 1970, averaging $1,093 per capita in 2016, up from $119 per capita uh, in 1970, which is $590 in 2016 dollars. So really, um, the per capita out-of-pocket expense, even though it's a smaller share of the total national health expenditure, actually rose during that time between 1970 pre way pre ACA up to 2016 when the ACA was in effect. So people were still spending more for their own health care from out of pocket sources. Okay, so then we see that private insurance accounted for only 21% of the expenditures in 1970 and public insurance, again, that would be Medicare and Medicaid accounted for 22% and then other 24%. Okay, so what changes by 2016? What changes is that insurance becomes much more prominent, private insurance and public insurance. So Medicare, Medicaid and CHIP, Children's Insurance Program, become more prominent in 2016. And those public insurance lines also include things like the, uh, the VA insurance and military insurance and other government direct provision provided insurance to its respective recipients. So the point of this is that um, there is probably a popular discourse that said pre ACA we had what some people called a free market healthcare system. I would just assert that we didn't have anything like a free market healthcare system. Um, my opinion is that if we had a free market healthcare system, we would have an equilibrium price for just about everything in healthcare. You know, prescription drugs, uh, the cost of procedures like an MRI. The closest thing we come to to a free market healthcare system, again, in my opinion, and you're free to refute this, are the emergent care clinics or what some people call dock in a box. If I'm out playing softball and I, you know, break my arm, I go to a emergency care clinic and maybe a doctor resets my arm and he says, we don't accept insurance. The cost of setting your arm is $250. And I say, okay, I pay that. And they, they base that price on perhaps something approaching an equilibrium price. Um, but my contention is that we divided up healthcare into, you know, free market healthcare and government provided healthcare. When in fact, since uh, World War II, really, we have been growing in our healthcare system to really a hybrid kind of provision of healthcare and healthcare insurance. Okay, so here's my next assertion which is citizens have no basic understanding about the sheer volume of collaboration and alternative service delivery that is happening. Uh, and this is another example that I think tugs at the heartstrings of a lot of people in our public discourse. And so for example, I use military operations specifically in Afghanistan and Iraq. So this chart um, comes from a, um, Congressional Research Service report, and I have the reference on the next slide. Uh, what this shows is the approximate number of military personnel in Iraq and Afghanistan and the supporting areas 
in 2008. So at the end of 2008, there were 160,734 US military troops in Iraq. This was before President Obama withdrew the troops from Iraq. There was 38,427 in Afghanistan. Of course, there's other numbers and you can see there of military personnel that actually support supported the operations in Iraq and Afghanistan. Uh, and the numbers are indicated on on this slide. So really, um, there's really about 294,000 military personnel supporting operations in Iraq and Afghanistan. But in country itself, there was, you know, somewhere around 210,000 military personnel in Iraq and Afghanistan at the end of 2008. Yet, uh, I provide you a source from, there's the link for the map, that uh, Congressional Research Service report. The second link I have here is from a, a Government Accountability Office report of 2008, where it talks about the number of contractor personnel in Iraq and Afghanistan. The GAO calculated there were about 196,000 contractor personnel in Iraq and Afghanistan directly supporting US troops in those two countries in 2008. So roughly, if you just took those two countries themselves, uh, just over half of the personnel were US military and almost another half were contractor personnel. So th there are also contractors in those other nations um, on that map, but I just don't include them. But contractor functions range from everything from dining facilities uh, to construction, to maintenance of weapon systems, such as some aircraft or some ground weapon systems, um, to security services. So when you say security services, you should actually think of people who carry weapons and who are authorized to use them under uh, various protocols. Um, but what the GAO also states is that there is no central office in the Department of Defense that tracked all the contractors that operated in the theaters of operations. And in addition, I don't say it here, but there's no central office that hires all those contractors. They're hired by different commands for different purposes uh, and having to do with different weapon systems and different functions. So the DOD outlay for contract services overall, that not just in the war zone, but throughout the whole DOD for 2000, uh, this says for 1996 to 2006, a couple years before the 2008 mark, um, went from 100, went from about 85 billion in 1996 in 2006 dollars to 151 billion in 2006. That's a 78% increase according to the GAO. What that also means, if you actually look at the DOD budget, that's about 28%, about 28% of the DOD's 2006 budget was for contract services, 28%. Um, so even though we think of DOD as kind of a stereotypical classic pyramid bureaucracy, um, you know, com composed of uniform personnel and civilian employees, in fact, the DOD is really a network that includes corporations, and other for-profits, some non-profits on bases that are doing work with the troops, um, such as one of the more prominent ones is the Red Cross, um, and support in kind from states and other nations. What do I mean by that? Basing in states, uh, most congressional members really like to have basing in their states, but the downside of basing is uh, there's a lot of land taken up by bases, and I will tell you those bases don't pay property taxes to the state. So in a sense, you can think of that as support in kind, or at least a trade-off between a state, uh, which says, yes, we would love for you to occupy our territory with your military base, because we know that that provides employment, and it also means that stationed people there are spending a lot of money in our state. Same thing with other nations. So in spite of rhetoric that you often hear about the NATO nations uh, not paying their fair share or our allies in Japan and South Korea not paying their fair share, the fact of the matter is, uh, for the most part, they provide us the land 
for that basing and some other services, particularly in South Korea, that that is in kind. And so really, we we in addition to being alliances, NATO is actually a network of countries. Well, my next assertion is that government, I should have said governments in the United States operate largely through collaboration, yet almost no one who runs for office talks about that. So what do you hear candidates talk about, right? Depending on their partisan point of view, you might hear contract or uh, contractors, yeah. Elected officials talk about, um, we should run government like a business. I'm not sure what they mean by that. Or government should provide more for the people because government exists to take care of the people. Those are kind of polar opposite points of view. Um, but they're also just sort of assertions that really don't necessarily say a whole heck of a lot. So here's some examples of collaboration that have been going on in government for many years. So support of the agriculture sector, this is near and dear to those of us who grew up in Nebraska. Um, support of the agriculture sector is really a collaboration of the United States Department of Agriculture, of universities, specifically land grant universities like the University of Nebraska Lincoln, um, farm supports, trade advocacy by national and state governments, uh, and tax incentives. The governor of Nebraska, the governor of Iowa, uh, and this has not varied between Democrats and Republicans, routinely take trade delegations to countries like China uh, to talk about our soybeans and our beef. Um, the trade is a hot topic right now, but uh, our trade delegations historically have worked to advocate national agriculture and tax incentives. So for example, in Nebraska, you don't pay sales tax when you buy a piece of farm equipment like you would pay when you buy a car. Um, another example, collaboration in, air in the air transportation sector through an air traffic control system and a safety system that are operated by the federal government, by the FAA. Um, airports, which are typically operated by local authorities and mostly friendly cooperation by airline corporation. So every time the FAA uh, says that we should inspect some component of an aircraft, so 737 engines, typically the, um, the airlines are fairly cooperative because it's in their best interest to do so. The fees that the airlines pay, pay for a lot of that system, not all of it, but the, the fees that the airlines pay and that you get charged on tickets you know, pay, help pay for the parts of the system that the government and governments are running. Again, uh, not all of it, but a lot of it. Um, another example, and I talked about healthcare, but a healthcare system that has been a hybrid of for-profit government, nonprofit, and professional providers long before the Affordable Care came about. Um, emergency management, preparedness, and response systems that we have in the United States rely on national authorities like FEMA, but also on state authorities and local authorities, many of whom are volunteers. So if you think of emergency management and we talk about first responders, where do first responders come from? They come from local governments. Many times, especially uh, when we talk about fire departments, many of those persons are volunteers. So emergency management responding to fires, responding to uh, tornadoes and other weather events, even responding to terrorist events. Typically, the first responders are local. Um, and so our sort of our public discourse gets in the way often when we talk about emergency management. And those of you in the emergency management concentration, I think, are pretty well aware of that. Um, our public discourse actually tends to to really misinform people, um, FEMA uh, and response to Hurricane Katrina. There was a lot more that went into um, governmental shortfalls than the FEMA's response in Hurricane Katrina. And finally, just remember 
uh, we've I've showed you a couple slides from this book by uh, Lester Salomon, The Tools of Government, 2002. Uh, and really, I, I also gave you, I think I gave you a link to chapter one. <laughs> That's a great chapter just to keep in mind um, when we talk about collaboration uh, and the execution of government programs. Um, my next assertion is that many nonprofits cannot exist independently of their missions of providing services on behalf of governments. That is, uh, many nonprofits do not simply do not exist independently from. Um, and here's an example. It's Project Harmony of Omaha. And I give you the link to Project Harmony. It's a great organization. It really is a great collaboration. Um, and I'd encourage you actually to look at Project Harmony if you've never heard of it in Omaha because it does great work. So what is Project Harmony? It is a collaboration of multiple agencies and partners to prevent and respond to child abuse and neglect in a seven county area in Nebraska and Southwest Iowa. So basically the larger Omaha Metro. Um, it was deliberately established as a collaboration. It wasn't established as a nonprofit that later on happens to get some of its funding from government sources. Um, it was established deliberately as a collaboration between public, private, and nonprofit. So what they say uh, on their website is essentially all forms of government, city, county, state, and federal coming together with collaborative nonprofit agencies all working to respond from one location addressing one issue one child at a time so it turns out project harmony has police officers working in their headquarters omaha police officers they have other state agencies working uh, with them collaboratively um, i give you some links here uh, again their main website their 2017 annual report and their irs form 990s and by the way those of you who are in nonprofit. 990s are a great source of data that you should be using a lot in your research. So this is Project Harmony's um, from their 2017 annual report. It's where I lifted this. Um, so you can see there that they got nine, almost $10 million in revenue in 2017. Six million, over six million is grants and contributions. And some of that is from government sources. That's in addition to the line that says government contracts, which is about 1.5 million. So those are contracts that Project Harmony has directly from governments to provide some services. And those services are listed over there on, on the right-hand side, their expenditure side. So the point is that um, they do actually get donations and contributions, but they get a lot of their money from government sources, specifically to act on behalf of governments in many cases. And so this is their revenue by source. And so you can see 53% of their revenue in 2017 in that 2017 report is from grants. Some of those grants are from private uh, foundations. A lot of it is from government sources. That's in addition to 16% from other government sources like contracts. Um, so here is my final assertion, and that is our public discourse seems to be an argument about agency theory versus stewardship theory. And you can find this on page 91 in the Agronoff book and the or surrounding pages. So what am I talking about here? Um, what I'm talking about is this, that because we, we really seem to have a lack of understanding about the level of collaboration between the sectors, we do talk about contracting out government services, but most of most of the discussion on our public discourse, discourse really is sort of primitive and um, not really well informed. So, for example, we talk about um, big, uh, we talk about companies that cities hire to do things like trash collection, right? So trash collection is fairly simplistic. Um, the, the city of Omaha hires a contractor th that owns uh, trash trucks and it goes around and it picks up trash, right? But the, the assertion is that um, we can't trust that trash company necessarily. And so we have to have a lot of oversight that, um, that makes sure that the government money is being spent effectively. But in fact, the relationship between the sectors is a lot more complex and a lot more collaborative than our typical discourse would indicate. 
So this is what Agronoff is talking about on page 91 of the text. And I'm not going to go through all of this. But when you talk about uh, agency theory, uh, that is principal agent theory versus stewardship theory, one thing that you should notice for those of you who took uh, 80, 90, and I think most of you probably did already, um, agency theory versus stewardship theory is actually a lot like McGregor's theory X and theory Y, um, which is, you know, McGregor's view of how workers are viewed from the eyes of manager, right? So we have a theory X view of workers. We have a theory Y view of workers. So workers should be constantly watched and monitored to make sure they're not slacking off, to make sure they're not stealing uh, inventory from us, to make sure they're not going on the internet during work hours, to make sure they're not coming in late and leaving early, to make sure they're not um, taking longer lunch breaks than they're authorized versus stewardship theory or, you know, theory Y of workers, which is uh, workers are part of the enterprise and actually have some ownership. And so what we should do is actually uh, positively encourage them to uh, make, make more of their ownership and become engaged employees. So some of you have um, actually heard of the Gallup organization, which is very interested in uh, employee engagement because the Gallup organization asserts that engaged employees actually uh, enhance the bottom line a lot more than uh, having a company with overlords who monitor everything that workers do. But when we talk about agency theory and stewardship theory, what we're really saying is that those who collaborate with us are either agents that we hire and need to be watched they don't necessarily have the same goals we do and so we have to come up with incentives and sanctions to bring them into conformance with our goals or stewardship theory which says that our collaborators actually do have mutual goals and that we start out with a trust relationship so agency theory really is is based on the idea uh, of insurance actually based on moral hazard and adverse selection right so i think you've heard of this so uh in insurance we insurance companies worry about adverse selection and moral hazard so for example um, when you purchase car insurance you have to tell the car insurance company how many accidents you've been in. You have to give them your driver's license number. You have to give them a lot of information because what they want to know is um, if you're a risk, right? As it turns out, uh, teenage drivers have more accidents than those of us who are older. So teenage drivers pay more for insurance. Um, an insurance company that charges the same premium for uh, a teenage driver that it charges to me would be engaging in adverse selection because they're taking on an unnecessary risk. So to mitigate that risk, they charge that teenage driver more in premiums. Moral hazard means that on the part of the individual, once that risk is covered, they might engage in behavior that they typically wouldn't behave in. So moving away from cars to health insurance, moral hazard of some uh, insurance is that uh, if we have a fee for service system in in healthcare and medicine and that means that every time a doctor does an mri or every time a doctor does a heart cath um, we pay that doctor based on the service that might incentivize some doctors to perform unnecessarily some of those services that they wouldn't have to perform so more hip replacements more knee replacements more heart caths that more MRIs than they have to typically perform. How does the insurance company try to control that? They try to control that by not paying providers anywhere near what they ask for those procedures, but negotiate a rate that the providers will ultimately accept, right? So when you get, when you have a procedure done and you get those uh, explanation of benefits and it says, you know, 
you had uh, you had an MRI done and the cost of the MRI is seventeen hundred dollars paid by the insurance company thirty or some outrageously ridiculous thing like that um, that's really a result of that negotiation between providers and the insurance company and that is the insurance company controlling for moral hazard stewardship theory and collaboration means that we trust people who come into the collaboration to begin with now here's the problem um, should we exercise principal agent theory or should we exercise stewardship theory my personal opinion is you know, when we talk about collaboration between organizations uh, I guess I'm not convinced that that it's an either or proposition it would depend on the nature of the collaboration I think um, and what we expect each party to be delivering uh, each party meaning there's probably many parties so in light of all that here's what I'd like you to do for the discussion um, and this again is based on all the reading you've done and this lecture itself um, so Agronoff says, he asserts in chapter nine, the title of the chapter is collaboration works, exclamation point. Um, and so he goes on to list about a dozen ideas that you should know from the collaboration literature. So using this chapter, along with the rest of the Agronoff chapters you've read from this week and last week, here's what I'd like you to do. I'd like you to take the perspective of either a nonprofit manager or a local government manager, so your choice, which perspective you take, and discuss one beneficial aspect of collaboration and one detrimental aspect of collaboration with other agencies. Because I think it's true that the Agronoff chapter, the Agronoff book seems to take a, uh, a positive view of collaboration throughout, but, I, but there are certainly detrimental aspects. So I'd like you to talk about those. So please be as expansive in your explanations as you can be. And I would also say that using an example would be very helpful and then provide feedback to each other. And my deadlines are as normal Thursday night and Saturday night. So that is it for this lecture. Uh, thanks. I appreciate the discussions that we've had in the class so far. Um, and I really appreciate the thought that you have all put into the work that I've been assigning you. Thanks a lot.